Hello there, thank you for joining me. Today we are going to be doing a playthrough of second edition Mansions of Madness. I'm going to be doing the playthrough using Tabletop Simulator rather than a physical on a table playthrough. Pretty much mainly because holding a, a phone camera or using a, a tr little tripod with my phone camera it's too fiddly for my taste. Um, in terms of giving you a feel of how the game plays, Tabletop Simulator does a perfectly reasonable job, I think. Um, and it also allows us to fairly uh, cleanly integrate the app that we will be using. Um, Mansions of Madness has a mandatory app that uh, you need in order to play the game. That's important word there, mandatory app. This is not a complimentary app that you can use to streamline things. It's it's absolutely necessary if you want to play the game. Um, let's get some ambiance. There we go. Creepy. Um, we won't need the app just yet. We'll uh, come back to this once we get started. I want to just go around the board just to give you... Why are you down there? Get back with your friends. Um, just go around the board, we'll, we'll pick our investigators um, and I'll just show you pretty much, this is the game up here, this, this is what I've highlighted in yellow, this is pretty much Mansions of Madness. Um, so sure, let's, let's go through just so you know where I'm pulling from and what I'm doing as I start playing. Uh, the two bags at the top, these are going to be our um, place tiles, this is going to represent rooms in the mansion. This bag is square tiles, they are the big ones. Rectangular tiles are the small ones. Um, that will become self-evident once I start pulling these out of here. We have our... The, the vast majority of the deck comes from these cards coupled with a few of these tokens. Um, so let's go through these, these decks that we have. Uh, we have two decks here. These uh, represent our items. Common items and unique items. There is no randomness involved with these two decks. And to the point that the, the rulebook in the physical game advises that you just keep these decks in alphabetical order. All you will be doing is searching for... The, the game is going to tell you, find you find a bottle of whiskey, take the whiskey card. You find a knife, take the knife card. Um, so you are just flicking through these decks, pulling it out and putting it by your investigator. There is no drawing a random common item, that, that I've come across at least. Um, however, that ends to a certain extent with the other four decks. These are random cards that you will pull with exceptions and special rules associated. The two in the middle, damage and horror, these are going to be our... this is how we track our health and sanity health, I guess. And this is physical damage, this is mental damage. Um, we take you know, physical damage, we're going to become wounded, we're going to get a condition from the condition pile uh, called wounded, which is going to mean that we can only take one movement action per turn. Uh, if we take enough horror damage, we're going to go insane, and we're going to get a condition insanity um, from here, which has... I'll go into that a little bit. I actually need to do something with the insanity cards. Um, I'll get to that in just a minute. But essentially these are cards are going to be pulled and when we take horror damage, we're going to, or physical damage, damage, damage or horror, we're going to pull the card and we're going to flip it to see what's on the other side. Sometimes we won't and the, a card will specify that. It will say, take four face down horror, for example. Um, and the, the intricacies involved with that, the, the systems that it plays into and which it complements, uh, will hopefully become clear as we continue playing. Um, I should mention the spells. The spells kind of belong with the common and unique items in that they are possessions, but spells aren't classified as items for the purpose of specific effects that mention items. Um, but you can drop these on the floor and trade them, etc. Uh, the reason I have kept these to one side like the, these are close together because they're pretty much identical, just different piles. This is separate because this will need shuffling. Um, for example, the way this game handles, for example, spells is 
Um, say we find a wither spell. There are five separate cards all representing the wither spell in here. The front of the card is identical. However, the back of every one of these cards is different. They have effects that happen after you cast it, feedback, if you will, that you cannot predict. Uh, spell casting in Mansions of Madness is inherently unpredictable, um, contrary to something like swinging a big stick of wood at a monster that is a predictable effect. You might drop the piece of wood or it might break, but none of that is outside the realm of comprehension, whereas when you cast a spell, kind of, there's, there's, a, there's a thematic element of anything might happen. You're never 100% in control of, of spell casting in this game. So when we pick a Wither spell, uh, we are going to just take a random one of these. Um, nicely, what if you notice these numbers, um, this means that this is the ninth card in this deck of cards. This, 30 cards here. This with a spell is number 9. This is 11, 14, etc. Um, if we whoops, if we shuffle it and then go back in, you'll see that the, the they have changed places. They are random. So as long as I shuffle these before I go in and search for wither, um, I don't actually know what's on the back of this. So it, it's a handy way to always ensure that I'm picking a random card. Uh, the the random factor there that I mentioned is linked to the some of the conditions at least. Certainly the insanity condition that I mentioned. So as you can see there are ooh, 12 uh, different insanity conditions. Um, I actually need to do a little bit of housekeeping. Maybe I should have done this before but I, I thought I would save it for the actual video because um, some of you may be interested in what's on the back of these cards if you're not uh, familiar with the game or if you're thinking about picking the game up. So for the most part, um, the game plays the same. I can close it now. So these are all of the insane cards. When you take, let's say, who are we looking at here? William Yorick here has seven sanity damage. If at any point in the game he um, ends an action with seven sanity cards or, or horror damage then he goes insane and he has to discard a certain amount of cards and pick one of these and they all have different information on the back the reason I have pulled them all out is because I cannot play with all of these they are the part of the game which is I'll just show you the front of the card, they're all the same on the front but as you can see, as an individual player, you do not tell the other players, if you're playing a two, three, four player game, you don't tell them what is on the back. Now I hope you can see in the bottom right corner, it has a little two plus there. Here it has a little three plus. So I, I, I'm hoping that you can see why I've pulled these out. I can't use these because I'm playing the solo game. I can only use the cards that are one plus. Um, as far as the game designers are concerned, the the cards that are 2 plus and 3 plus, they have been written, the rules for them have been written in such a way that um, they are for, it, it's sort of a traitor mechanic in, in some ways, um, your, your win condition alters. So rather than trying to f solve the mystery and escape the house, it might be something as um, offensive and uh, aggressive as murder one of the other players. It might be something as just downright peculiar as you cannot win unless all of the search tokens have been um, explored. Um, point being, you can't tell the other players and, and it, it impacts how you yourself play the game if you go insane, but it most importantly impacts how the other players treat you. You can no longer be trusted because there is a chance that you are just a hostile element now. Anyway, uh, what I will do, um, I'm going to quickly just zoom in. If you want to read these, then pause the video and you can read them at your heart's content. Um, but I'm not going to linger on it because I know the, some people might consider this spoilers. But if you pause the video now, 
hopefully you count that and now I'm just gonna take out everything that is uh, do, 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 three and two so that's these so we are left with just four cards as you can see for a solo player game so a solo game is two investigators so it's 99% identical to a two-player game except that there are some of these insanity cards which do work in a two-player game. Some of them don't work in a, a solo player game because obviously a traitor, any kind of traitor mechanic just fails if you're only playing solo. Uh, I'm just going to delete these because I don't need them and I'm going to take these insanity cards and just pop them back into the condition deck and give it a shuffle. Uh, the other tokens that we have, we have our, uh, these represent clues, searchable items, explore typically represents doors that you're going to open and look through to find more rooms, sight would typically represent say a large field where you can't see the far end of it but if you travel far enough you can just look in a direction and it will reveal more rooms and then interact would be something that you need to actually go to and use rather than searching through a cupboard or opening a door it's just it's like a lever that you would have to pull or uh, a crank that you would have to turn a number of times etc um, we have tokens representing rooms that are particularly dark rooms that are not particularly dark because they're on fire and then we have doors that we can add to rooms um, we have walls where we can cover up doors. If, if a room has a door in a certain wall but the app doesn't want us to have a wall, uh, a door there, then we can use these walls to cover them up. Um, barricades can be used to um, push up against doors and that can slow down monsters maybe. And we have secret passages. We have our monster tokens here, 24 of them, and then I've pulled these from a workshop upload um, I will link, at the very least I will mention the workshop uploads that I'm using in here. There's a couple I've uh, pulled from. Obviously the main one with all the cards and then I've pulled a few like these pieces come from a different workshop upload. Um, and then we have these pieces down here. These again are, these are actually just from Tabletop Simulator for the most part, apart from this Chthonian. Uh, but these are going to be our player characters, male and female and a, a specific colour. Anyway, we have dice up here as well, as I'm sure you've meant, noticed. I think we're ready to go. Sorry, I, I went on a little bit there. I think we're ready to go, though. I already kind of know which two... <laughs> it's these, I'm hovering over them. Just to... I know which two I'm going to pick. I'm not going to do it randomly, because I'm not familiar enough with the game. Uh, I'm going to pick Rita Young and William Yorick. I will slowly pan across give you a chance to see the eight included investigators but yeah I'm gonna stick with these they are aggressively average um, especially William Yorick just lots of fours and threes no fives no twos he's not super great at anything he's not really crap at anything um, Rita Young is particularly good, she's particularly strong, but she has a crappy influence. To be honest, in this first campaign, this first scenario rather, that we're going to do, I haven't come across a single instance where influence has come into play. So I'm perfectly fine. And these two special effects that they have, whenever a monster is defeated, Yorick will gain a clue as the grave digger. He likes dead bodies. And just being able to move three spaces rather than two whenever she wants. These are just... Um, these two effects are just very consistent. You can make use of them every single turn. Some of the other effects are powerful, but they're very... Um, oh, it, it, it's almost like, oh look, here's a turn where I can actually make use of this effect. Um, so I'm just going to go with consistency and keep these two. Uh, which means that I can just delete those from the existence of the universe. They do not exist anymore. Let's throw these down. I'm going to use... Uh, a yellow male for Yorick because his picture is slightly yellowish and I'm going to use a blue a blue female for Rita so yellow male and blue female let's bring these over okay I think we are ready to start uh, I hope you're still with me 
what we will do, we'll move over to the app and get started, I guess. Are we ready? I think we're ready. So here we can pick the scenario that we're doing. There are only four, you can see these down here. One, two, three, four. A varying difficulty and vastly varying uh, duration. Uh, this is the recommended start scenario which they're going to do. It's a short one and it's not very difficult. Um, just to give you an idea of what the other ones are like, we have an Innsmouth scenario. Quite difficult. A good one and a half to two and a half hours there. This one is extremely difficult. Bit of a Cthulhu theme going on. Um, going to be two to three hours. And then this fella, um, not so difficult, but really, really long. So it's just going to be, the app is just going to be throwing rooms at you. Lots of exploration. Um, put aside a, f a full day if you're going to be playing this one. I'm going to stick with this, Cycle of Eternity. Uh, I've played this twice now. Um, both the times were quite close, and both times were enjoyable, and both times were successful. So it, it bodes well for a a, uh, a third run through. But it, it certainly gives a, a good taste of the, the game as a larger whole. You can see how it can expand and become more difficult. Uh, the app can become um, much, much, much more vicious should it ever wish to. So we're going to keep it on Cycle of Eternity. We're going to select our investigators that we have done already. We have Rita and we have Yorick. And the app is going to tell us what our starting items are. So we have a Holy Cross, a Kerosene Lantern, a Machete, a Whiskey. This uh, brown symbol here indicates that these are common items and then these are going to be spells. I don't know what Feed the Mind is. So let's uh, in the common item deck over here, we will just quickly search for holy, the holy cross, a kerosene lantern, a machete, oops, and some whiskey. And then in the spells, we want to find, what was it, Feed the Mind? Yes. So again, we have five here. What I will do, you saw me shuffle it before, but for the sake of just being thorough, so I don't know which one is which, I can shuffle the deck, search for all the Feed the Mind spells, and then I'll just take the first one each time. So these are our five items. We cannot, at this point, look at the back of this Feed the Mind spell. But let's take a look at what these are. And then allocate them uh, as appropriate. Uh, in terms of our investigators, neither has any particular strengths. They are actually just both quite physical characters. Uh, Rita is faster. William Yorick is going to be having more clues, I guess. I think Rita is going to be our fighter, and William will be our explorer, even though exploration typically does lead into fighting. Uh, what I notice is uh, William's agility of three, in this first scenario at least, agility checks are really common, I, I, I noticed. Um, during combat, just during general mythos, um, bullshit and uh, evasion should should you ever need to try evading but it is what it is um, ideally we would give each of these a weapon but it only looks like we have one weapon so I'm gonna give the machete to Rita let's give the light source to Yorick especially because he, he has one in his hand um, if I remember from the rule book correctly also, um, I think it says there are heavy weapons and there are bladed weapons. Heavy weapons are better suited for high strength characters, bladed weapons are better suited for high agility characters. 
Um, but whatever, we'll give the machete its bladed weapon. Uh, four agility is high. Um, discard up to two face down horror. So if Rita is going to be doing the majority of the fighting, let's give her the whiskey. Because she'll be seeing some nasty shit. Um, what is this? Roll one additional die while resolving a. And the symbol there is a, a head which represents willpower at the bottom here. You can see at the bottom next to Yorix 4 down at the bottom right. So, willpower check. Willpower checks are very, very, very common. Um, let's give this to. I think we'll just give it to. Spell casting typically uses law, uh, and both of our characters have a crap law of three. Three seems average, but it's not really. It, the numbers you get typically are two, three, four, and five. Two is very bad, five is very good, four is good, three is bad, essentially, um, because so many of the difficulty checks are difficulty two. So if you're rolling three dice, but you need to make two successes on a difficulty two check, that's, that's not easy. You or another investigator within range become focused, then flip this card. I can't remember what the focused effect is. I remember using it. Let's um, just check what focused is. So, when we are focused, uh, you can discard the focused status. So it's a buff. You can get rid of the buff at any time to convert clues to successes. Okay. So it is a way to convert clues to success without having clue tokens. Sure, that's useful. I can put that back in. Okay. And if she's doing combat, I think... I think I want this... Hmm. It doesn't really matter, to be perfectly honest. Let's give it to Rita, just for the sake of. No, you know what? Let's give it to Yorick. Because what I'm worried about is, as a spell, when this gets cast, we're going to flip it and it's going to have a secondary effect. And we don't know what that is. And it could be something really detrimental. And if we have Rita as our uh, combat-focused character, I'm, I maybe want to keep her her um, her status a little bit more predictable, maybe. I don't know. Should we get going? I think we're ready. Those are our items. Yeah, we're ready. Okay. Let's uh, take a look at the app. Oh, is this where I have to narrate stuff? There is some narration at the start here, uh, but I guess this is not going to be narrated. So you get to hear my dulcet tones. There was thunder in the air on the night I went to the deserted mansion atop Tempest Mountain to find the lurking fear. H.P. Lovecraft, The Lurking Fear. It's a good book. It's a pretty good book. Let's begin the scenario, huh? You slump into your office chair after another long day of interview. You've been investigating the disappearances surrounding a wealthy neighborhood for two weeks, but you have nothing to show for it. The telephone rings. You answer and hear the panicked voice of an older man. Is, is this the investigator who visited the Vanderbilt estate? You flip through the files on your desk. William Vanderbilt, a wealthy bachelor, mother recently deceased. He has refused to meet with you but you were able to speak to several members of his serving staff. This is Eugene, Mr. Vanderbilt's butler, right? I didn't know who else to call. The police think I'm crazy. Unnatural things have started happening here. I'm worried for my master. I, I think he's in danger. Please, help. Finally, a lead. You hang up the phone, throw on your coat, and leave for the Vanderbilt estate. Okay. Ah. 
Your car rattles up the uneven drive, pulling to a stop in front of the estate. Several cars and carriages are parked along the drive. However, the butler who contacted you is nowhere to be seen. You knock on the large oak door to no response. Fearing something has happened, you try the handle and the door swings open into a lavish entryway. And then we're going to place entry hall and bathroom tiles and walls as indicated. So this is pretty much how the app is going to dictate the, the flow of the game. It is going to give us some flavor and then it is going to tell us to uh, populate the, the table, essentially your kitchen table that you're playing on uh, with various elements um, that you would have set up prior. So it wants the entry hall which we can just go into. As you can see, the entry hall is a rectangular... You can't actually see because the, the, the text is in the way. But trust me, that's a rectangular board. So we're going to go over here into rectangular and we're going to search entry. And here it is. And then we, we want to make sure that we are putting it the right way. I think it goes that way. And bathroom. So this is an odd mansion. We come in here at the bottom and then it's just straight away there's a, a hallway there and the the house's bathroom is directly there because this isn't bathroom one or bathroom two this is the only bathroom in the in the in the game and i think that's the bathroom yeah so let's just zoom in make sure that is nice nope it's overlapping so there so here is our mansion thus far. You can also see, uh, yes, it's saying and walls as indicated. So it's saying to put a wall here. So as you can see on the entry hall tile here, it has four doors, but the app doesn't want us to have this door in the game. So we are going to pull one of the wall tiles. That's the entire stack of wall tiles, we don't want that, just one of them, and we're going to cover up this door so that it no longer exists in the game. There. So there are only three doors, unless the, the, the text is covering something else up, because it does say walls, and I can only see one. Anyway, we'll click and ex uh, go on to the next part. Ah, there is another one up there. You step into the warmth of the house. A strange stillness hangs in the air, and your footsteps echo through the quiet entrance. Then we place our investigators. And I'll put this other... whoops, a daisy. I'll put this other wall up here. Beautiful. So as you can see, or maybe you can, See this line here? This is bisecting this, this single tile into two spaces. So this is one room, or essentially this is this whole thing is one room. Because I don't think that counts as a wall there. No, it does not. So this is one whole room, um, but it is bisected into spaces here. We have one space here, one space there. I guess it's not bisecting because there are three spaces. And it looks like this continues down the side here. So we may get a sight token here. So once we step into this space, we can then see down this corridor, for example. Um, but that's how movement works. Um, it's just space to space. But then you have to keep track of what is considered a room, um, etc., etc. We'll carry on. See what the app is saying. We can get rid of this. On the left wall of the entry hall sits a table with a small pile of papers. So, as a, an action that we can take, we can go over to this search token that is on this table and search it. A mysterious painting of a nighttime landscape dominates the right wall of the entry. We get to place another search token over here. Oh. 
The silence is broken by the muffled shouts and sounds of crashing pots and pans coming from the door on your right. Oh dear. You can place an explore token. So as I mentioned, explore tokens typically represent doors that you can go through. And you will get some flavour saying, is this a... Oh gosh. Oh dear me. Oh gosh. We all good? Everything fine? We all good? Everything's cool? Everything's cool. So yeah, exploration... An exploration token is typically you're going to be laying another tile. Whereas a search token is you're going to be finding items that you put in your inventory. You notice a shelf stacked with books and other objects nearby. Pushing it in front of the door could prevent someone or something from coming through. We have a barricade. barricade in this corner. Sure. What I have done with these tiles, you probably already noticed, I have coloured the, um, the, the inside. So there's UV mesh that gives it its um, artwork, but then these, these sides are typically left just colourable and, and I've given them different colours. Just because in my first playthrough I was finding I was having a difficulty, like, just looking at this here, I was having difficulty, for example, spotting that there was a barricade there, and I was forgetting. Um, I don't know how useful it is, but sure, that little red line there, it makes it a little bit easier to spot. The hole continues deeper into the mansion. Place a site token as indicated. An investigator in hole corner 3 may reveal the adjacent area. So yeah, as, as I thought, um, we can grab one of these sight tokens. And because we've entered here, we can't see what's going on down this part of the hall. But as long as we step into here, without using an action, we can reveal the rest of this whole area. Three other doors lead into the mansion. Place explore tokens as indicated. So we have an explore there, an explore there, and an explore there. And I don't know why, but <laughs> Tabletop Simulator is having these tokens be hoverable. So that is peculiar. Um, it's the first time I've seen this. So there is a door here. This is considered a door. So we don't actually know what's in this room. We know there's a bathroom here, which maybe we shouldn't, but I get that's just how the tiles have worked out. Um, I think what the game would rather us have is not be able to see this, but it's working with squares and rectangles, so it is what it is. Um, and that is that, I believe. Yeah. So it's just leaving us to our business now. So let's come back to the full table. So, at this point, we can choose who goes first. It's completely up to us, and we get to choose what we want to do. So this was the door that had noise behind it. So if we go back to the app, and we click on here. We can click on this, it doesn't take any actions. And we can get some flavor. A ruckus can be heard on the other side of this door, shouting the crash of pots and pans, and is that hissing? And as you can see, this button here with Explore has this little icon. This is an action icon. Each investigator gets two actions per turn. So in the app, you essentially get two... You get to press two buttons that have this icon on it, is how the game is going to flow. So I can cancel this and come over here and click on there. It's fine. And this is all allowed. It's only when I actually commit to one of these action buttons I am spending an action item. So, um, I want to explore the other side of this room. I don't like the noises on the other side, and I don't want what I was making those noises. I don't want to have them doing their thing and coming out later at an inopportune moment. I don't know what this is all about. This loading at the top. Uh, what I will do is I'll finish this turn and then I'll probably restart Tabletop Simulator for the second video because we're getting on for 30 minutes, um, 35 minutes already. Um, 
and fix this loading thing. I think what it's actually doing is one of these cards is, is not loading or a token isn't loading the underside. It's something stupid. Just a tabletop simulator quirk. Anyway, um, let's finish turn one. So, we're going to have Rita, badass extraordinaire. She is going to explore this room. So we're going to click on the, the Ruckus room and explore. It is going to tell us to place down a big room and it's going to give us information about what is inside this room. The door swings open to reveal a dining room in chaos. An aging man in a tailcoat scrambles through a serving window into the kitchen as he tries to escape a strange black creature writhing on the dining room table. So we get rid of the explore token. And we're going to place the dining room, which is a square tile. So we want to flip this around. So half of this board is the dining room, half of it is the kitchen, and it's separated by a wall and a, a serving hatch. You can see here there is this dashed line going along here. This is like a serving hatch. Um, it's in. It's called an impassable barrier or something. It means that we can't walk through here, so we can't go from this space to this space. Um, we can go from this space to this space. This is just a, a regular barrier, but this represents um, like a small hole that you'd have to crawl through that is not easy. Blah, blah, blah. Let's make sure this fits nicely. Sometimes the, the physics of Tabletop Simulator is a little bit too accurate for its own good. That'll do. That'll do. Right then. Um, the creature turns to face you. Its black, serpentine body shifts and changes, playing tricks on your eyes as you try to focus on it. The creature unfurls its leathery wings and unleashes a blood-curdling screech. Spawn a hunting horror, as indicated, and suffer two horror with a willpower negation. So, let's uh, spawn a hunting horror. The way I'm using these, um, these monsters are essentially, this is just a humanoid monster, like a cultist. This is a human-sized, but not humanoid monster. And then this is a monster that is just big and grotesque. Um, so a hunting horror, I think, is roughly human-sized. Um, but it's, it's basically a snake with wings, I believe. Um, but we'll use, we'll use this. Uh, I'm just going to copy it. Paste it here. And then we have to find a hunting horror. And I'm just going to attach this using the uh, the joint tool to that. It should work. F7. You do that. You draw a line from there to there. And then now, yeah. So they're now attached. So I can pick up that, and everything works. Super. Okay. So. This is our monster, and the monster is in this first space. It was on the dining room table, wasn't it? Okay. And we have to suffer two horror. So, this is Rita. Rita is the one poking her head here. She needs to make a willpower check. So the number in the bottom corner, will, four, to negate two points of horror damage. Uh, she has a will of four, so we want four dice. That's three, four. And then for every success here, we're going to negate one point of horror damage. So we want two successes, ideally, to negate both points of horror. Uh, we have got two successes, so that's fine. So that negates both points of horror. Uh, on the app, it's telling us that there was a knife somewhere. Jesus. So I missed that. I, I clicked. I was hoping it wouldn't 
um, move on, but I guess you don't have to click the button. You just have to click on the, the, the screen. So I'm just going to go back and check what that said using the message log. In the center of the dining table, a carving knife sits embedded in a roast. Place the knife common item as indicated. Uh, an investigator can pick up an item in the space as part of the trade action. So I think the knife was... If I had to guess... I don't think it's going to be where the hunting horror is, but it did say that it is on the table. So I think it's in this space. Although I didn't see it, and the app doesn't tr track that, sadly. Um, I don't believe... Look, it's not shown on here. Anyway, a china cabinet stands against the wall, though it looks to have been repurposed to store a manner of knickknacks. We're going to place a search token over in this space. And then in the dining room, we have a, another clue over here. You can see a kitchen through a serving window. Most of the cabinets are ajar due to the food preparation, but one that has been locked shut with a chain catches your attention. Place a search token. We have another search token. In the kitchen, you can also see that someone has left the refrigerator open. Water leaks out into a puddle on the floor. Place a search token as indicated. Oh, we have a dude. You spot the old man you saw climbing through the serving window huddling in the corner behind the oven. Sweat beads off his brow and his eyes bulge in terror. Place a person token as indicated. This is Eugene, the butler. Okay, let's go find Eugene, uh, who's in the person bag. Eugene. Hello. And Eugene is over here, huddled by the oven. You may move one space into the explored area. So, as an exploration action that I did when I hit the, the red token here, I also um, additionally am allowed to take one movement space, which I'm going to take. I'm going to move one space into here. So that was my first action. I explored here. We went through that lengthy app-driven um, population of the, the game board where we place the tile and we put all the various elements on the board that the app wanted us to. And this is a busy room. They won't all be this busy, but this is obviously a bit of a plot room. There's a monster in here. We have an NPC. There's an item. Lots of different searchable items. So uh, Rita has to finish her move. Uh, Yorick can't do anything until Rita has finished her turn. She has a second action. And I think it makes sense for us to attack this hunting horror. So. The way to do that is we want to hit this tab here, which is the monster draw, and that is going to show us the hunting horror down here as a as a monster that the app is keeping track of. We can try to evade it. Say we wanted to explore uh, this token here. We couldn't do that without first evading the monster because the monster is in the same space. We're not going to do that. We're just going to attack the damn thing. Um, let us see what she is equipped with. I already know, but I just want to be uh, checkable. So she's holding a bladed weapon, a machete to be precise. Strength 2. So we're going to attack with a bladed weapon. You throw the full force of your weight behind a vicious stab. We have to make a strength check, difficulty 2. So if we go to the main board, we are making a strength check. We have a strength of 5, so we roll 5 dice. And we, it's difficulty two, so we have to get two successes. Let's take a look at what we have. We have one success, two successes. If you pass, your blade punches deep into, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. There we go, that's what I should have done. You throw the full force of your weight behind the blah, blah, blah. If you pass, your blade punches deep into the creature's flesh. The monster suffers damage equal to the weapon's damage plus your test results. If you fail, the creature narrowly avoids the deadly thrust. So, we did not fail. We passed. Uh, damage equal to the weapon's damage plus test result. So, we got... I wonder what the health of the hunting horror is. Because it would be really nice to kill this thing in one. So, we can check the health by 
this is basically the damage here. Oh, it has the health up in the corner. There we go. So it has a health of five. So right now, I am doing... It was two successes, right? And two health. Yeah, so we're doing four damage. You know, I think when we were taking our items, I think there was an extra line in there that said, you also have two clue tokens. But as it stands, I missed it, so I'm going to just take that on the chin. Um, we've done four damage, according to the rules. So let's just bump it up to four. If we had a clue token, I would have spent it on one of uh, these bad boys. These, these magnifying glass icons. Just change that into a success. That would have given us three successes, plus the two damage, five damage. It would have been killed in one turn. But I don't have any clue tokens, because I think I've screwed up um, in the... Uh, item acquisition. Whatever. It's no big deal. Um, so that is Rita's turn. Now, Yorick could rush in there and help. He could move and attack. Might not be a bad idea just to get rid. Because otherwise we have to deal with this messing us up in the mythos phase. I kind of feel like maybe we'll do that. Okay, yeah. So, he is going to... Let's go through this, for the first time that we do this, let's do this properly. So, as his first action, Yorick is going to activate his movement. Now, what that does is it gives him two movement points that he can use this turn. Um, a movement activation allows you to move two spaces. So, this isn't a case of, for his first action, he has to move and then do something by picking the move activation it's just given him two movement points so he's going to spend one of those movement points to come into here and then he's going to use his second action to attack this monster he doesn't have any weapons I believe no he does not so he's going to attack unarmed as you approach the creature, you meet its gaze, and the unknowable alien intelligence you see strikes a deep, devouring fear into your heart. You try to persevere and complete your attack. We have to make a willpower check with difficulty 2. Um, Yorick has a will of 4. Difficulty 2? Uh, we have 3 successes. Fantastic. So we passed. If you pass, you manage to bury the fear long enough to strike at the very eyes that so affected you and the creature recoils in pain, the monster suffers three damage. Which is to say, the monster dies. If you fail, blah blah blah, we did not fail, we passed. So, do three damage. It is As soon as we hit the health total, the app is going to prompt us to um, get rid of it as a, as a kill. And it is now dead. So, let's before we deal with the app, let's go back to the game. Um, pick the hunting horror up and we'll just drop him over there. Okay, so that was Yorick's second um, action, but he still does have one movement point that he can use from his first action. Let's uh, go back to the app. What did it say? I, <laughs> I really wish the app it wouldn't treat an off click as a button press. It has a continue button there. Oh dear. Uh, let's go to the message log. The creature lurches to the ground dead. Hearing the monster's final fate, the old man in the kitchen cautiously steps out. Move Eugene as indicated. I think... Did it move? It was Eugene here? I think it did. It's, that's annoying that it doesn't have the continue button. Um, so, he has one movement point left, which, I guess because I want to check this, I'm going to use that to go over here. Okay, that is, both investigators have used their two actions. Uh, we now go to the Mythos phase. A sudden sharp crack and a slam sound out, making William Yorick jump. William Yorick suffers one face-down horror, 
with a negation from willpower. So Yorick has to make a willpower check. Oops, a daisy. Do we have any successes? There's a success. Oh, that's the wrong button. There was a success there. I promise. Uh, so we negated the 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 face down horror. And back to investigate face. Right. That is a 50 minute video. Um, it took a lot longer than I, I hoped for. I think just because um, I'm getting used to the, the controls and I had a lot to explain. The turns will become a lot snappier as the, the videos go on, I think. Um, at this point early on, I'm, I'm a, there's, there's an assumption that you're not familiar with Mansions of Madness. Uh, you're not just watching this to follow along with something you already know, but you're watching it to learn a bit, a bit a little bit about how the game plays, etc, etc. Um, so I will take a short break here, and when I come back with video part two, we will steam on. Um, this is quite a fast-paced game, which I probably haven't um, shown very <laughs> effectively so far. But I assure you, this is quite a fast-paced game. Once we um, get our momentum going, uh, you will see. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to save it here. I also want to just put a quit in, because I, I really want to get rid of this. I don't know what the hell that is going on. I don't know if that's the uploader, there's a bit of uh, something going on with uh, the image hosting site, but if I close this down and open it back up, that will hopefully get rid of that, because it's a bit annoying. Anyway, thank you for watching. Uh, I hope you'll rejoin me for part two. Um, yeah, take care. See you soon.